it's unbelievable uh, in this day and age to think that people still get that news, that there's a problem and there's nothing you can do about it. The challenge of ultra-rare diseases not receiving the attention they deserve is sometimes burdening. At the time of Garrett's diagnosis, we were shook by the, the life changing news that we received. When you tell them what your daughter has or had, and their response is, oh, I read about that in medical school. It's um, a bit disheartening. We, we were told, uh, Ryan can't do this, can't do that, he won't do that, and he won't be around for that. As a way to manage the grief process was to focus on others. When you are faced with one of the worst things any parents can be faced with, I think has been why I think advocacy has continue to be such an important role in our family. It is a difficult subject for many people, so for me it is important to share my story. There are individuals out there who are not being represented in rare diseases who need that community. Receiving the Torch Award is uh, a, a tremendous honor and, uh, and very humbling. My words and my advocacy efforts were valuable and inspirational. And now we got an award to, uh, to display in our home to say, yes, we, we believe in ourselves, we believe in the cause, and we believe in the story. You know, my son is so caring. He said stuff like, Dad, I, I know if, if I was the one to have San Filippo, you would fight just as hard for me. Good evening, everybody. I am Dwayne Clark, General Manager of U.S. Rare Diseases at Santa Fe, and I am thrilled to welcome you tonight to the sixth annual Torch Award celebration. I am here in our beautiful new offices in Cambridge, which opened recently to bring together employees across Massachusetts to do our best work for you. Earlier this year, Santa Fe asked the public to tell us about individual advocates who were working to shine a light on rare diseases and bring hope for the future. Thank you to everyone who submitted nominations. The Torch Awards Review Committee went to work selecting this year's class of winners. And over the next hour, you'll travel with me across the country to meet the 2022 honorees and catch up with recipients from previous years. We have a special welcome from a longtime friend of the rare disease community and a proud supporter of the Torch Awards program, Executive Vice President of Santa Fe Specialty Care, Bill Civil. Thanks, Dwayne, and good evening, everyone. Welcome to the sixth annual Torch Awards. I'm Bill Sibbald, Executive Vice President of Specialty Care at Santa Fe, and it's a true pleasure to open our show tonight. Thank you for joining all of us at Santa Fe in celebrating this accomplished group of advocates. Santa Fe's commitment to develop meaningful, innovative therapies for people living with rare diseases goes back over 40 years. It has been my privilege to lead our specialty care teams around the world, and it is an awesome responsibility to come to work each day knowing we can make a difference in the lives of people impacted by rare diseases. Each time I hear from a patient, a loved one, or an advocate, I'm reminded of something I say to my teams often. This really is the greatest industry in the world. And it's because of the work being done by people like recipients of this year's Torch Awards. Around the globe, Sanofians are dedicated to chasing the miracles of science because too many of the people who can benefit from those breakthroughs are waiting. We are all encouraged in what we do because of passion, dedication, and drive of individuals like tonight's honorees who help ensure a shorter road to diagnosis, a warmer community of support, better education, and better care. Over the next hour, Dwayne will take us across the country as he connects with the Torch 2022 winners in their homes. I hope you enjoy getting to know them as much as I have. To each of them, congratulations and thank you. This award is our way of saying that we see you, we appreciate you, and we are grateful for your leadership as advocates. Now, Dwayne, I might I say the very sharply dressed Dwayne, I need to get back to our Santa Fe watch party, so I'll hand it back to you, and let's get the show started. Thanks, Bill. We are so grateful to have your support tonight and throughout the year. Let's turn now to our first honoree, Christina Rosa Vargas. Earlier this summer, I visited Christina at her home in the beautiful Syracuse, New York, 
where she told me about her son, Juju, in May 2021, 18 months after he had started having seizures, Juju was diagnosed with CLN2, which is one of 13 types of a rare genetic condition known as Batten's disease. Shortly after receiving her son's diagnosis, Christina discovered trials for gene therapy were being explored, but not moving forward. Determined to find a way to support this research, she started a petition for a meeting with the FDA and collected close to 15,000 signatures. Yes, 15,000 from around the world in just a few months. Come with me as we head up to Syracuse, New York to meet Christina and hear more about her advocacy work on behalf of the Batten disease community. Christina, how are you today? I'm doing good. You know, thank you for letting us into your home. We're sitting in your backyard. It's a beautiful summer day. Maybe the first question that I would have for you, tell me a little bit about yourself, your family. My name is Christina and I am a student for criminal justice. Law is my passion. I'm a really quiet person. I kind of just like to be laid back and I like reading, uh, I like writing, uh, but most importantly, I just like spending time with my family. I have my little small family. I have my husband and my two kids, my daughter, Faith, and then Juju. Tell us a little bit about him. So Juju is five years old and he's such a lovable kid. He's very playful. Juju's always had speech delay since he was two years old. Uh, he started having seizures at the age of three. Uh, I remember getting a call. I was doing court reporting at that time. His daycare provider said he was having a seizure. I was just so confused. I rushed there in the cab. This was not normal. He never had seizures before. It was very frequently, at least like probably three times a month. When they came to do the test, there was a miscommunication. They thought they were supposed to test me, but it was supposed to be Juju. By the doctor, she never rescheduled it. So here we are, a whole year, almost close to a year, has gone by. The genetic testing was ordered. They did come, we did it. So I have these genetic results that says TPP1. I had no idea what it meant. Then his enzyme testing concluded uh, his level was a six. So that was what made the diagnosis of CLN2. Once diagnosis came, two weeks later, uh, he's having emergency brain surgery to have the reservoir implanted. Three days after the brain surgery, we're going to Rochester to do the infusions. It's kind of similar to like a chemo uh, infusion, but it's just in his head. And we had to stay overnight uh, for 16 hours after the infusion finished. So we'd be there for over 24 hours. I'm not the type of person to settle with what I'm being told. I always felt that there was more avenues to it. So that's what encouraged me to start advocating. There is no stronger love than that of a mother. You say you're a rookie, but you've had a big impact. And you know, your meeting with the FDA and the petition. At that point in time, what was going on in the community? And then what was the outcome of that meeting with the FDA? There was no communication really between uh, the parents and the CLN2 community and uh, with the FDA. So there was like that barrier. And I didn't like the fact that we're sitting here just waiting. I don't like just waiting, knowing that nothing is being done. I just randomly, honestly, one day I came up with this idea and I went on change.org, I wrote this uh, Petition. I shared it on Facebook with the CLN2 community and they shared it with their friends and family. And there's people that I've never even seen a day in my life that signed it. Over 14,000 signatures all over the world. But I know that in order to get things done, you have to have paperwork that's processed. There's legal processes within it. This petition on change.org, it's not enough. So I searched online, how do you submit a citizen petition? At first, I wasn't sure if I could do it because there's some legal language. I'm like, ugh, I know I'm a paralegal and not a lawyer yet, but I know I got this. So it took me two days to work on it. And then I went and submitted it, and there's actually a tentative decision on that. I 
still wasn't settled. Uh, that's when I emailed them directly and requested a patient listening session and it was granted and we had it on um, St. Patrick's Day. Uh, there was about like maybe 25 members from the FDA. That's a beautiful thing to see because then the FDA had like a meeting with the public a month after our patient listening session to get the opinions and views of everyone. With that, I didn't stop. Um, that was just one avenue. I am uh, actually gonna be doing Rear Across America coming up in August. And I had became a rare disease legislative advocate. So I got to meet with my state legislators and discuss um, the STAT Act. That is the Speeding Therapy Act. And that was something that was passionate to me. There's a lot that's uh, going on behind the scenes legislative. And that's why I love being involved. I'm not a lawyer yet, but uh, eventually I will be a lawyer in the rare disease community too. You started the Warrior Foundation. Talk to me about what your vision is. Its first objective was to raise uh, funds for research. However, there's so many different companies, family organizations, science companies that's already working on things like that. So what my vision for uh, the foundation is to work on bringing more health equity into the rare disease community. I just want to bring more awareness uh, to the rare disease condition and uh, trying to also help other families with advocating too. Your determination and passion inspires me and it's going to inspire everybody who watches the Torch Awards. So what does winning a Torch Award for 2022 mean to you? I cried. I feel so honored. Uh, it's just such a nice way to know that my efforts and attributes are being recognized. Uh, sometimes you don't feel like it is being honored and recognized, but this is that true moment where I feel proud of myself, so proud. What's your advice for other people that are joining the rare disease community? Don't give up. Uh, don't let one person's opinion stop you from your path. Uh, you're going to be rejected many times. Uh, you have to be that person that makes noise. I'm going to be that squeaky wheel that bothers somebody until they fix things. Honestly, that's one thing I've just always been very persistent in life. And I've always been that squeaky wheel. I wouldn't say squeaky wheel. I would say you are one of the most courageous people that I've ever met. So thank you for what you do. And, and it has been a true pleasure to spend this afternoon with you. So, so thank you so much for letting us in your, into your home. Thank you. Wow, thanks, Christina. For all you do to champion change for rare diseases and advocate for your son, you've achieved so much in a short time. Congratulations on receiving a 2022 Torch Award. You might remember Justin Hopkins from last year's show. He was recognized for his outstanding advocacy in ASMD. And during the Torch Award ceremony, he shared more about the work he does as the board chair for the National Neiman Pick Disease Foundation, an organization he joined because of his son, Garrett. It's been a busy year for Justin, and I'm excited to share an update from him now. So Justin, take it away. My name is Justin Hopkin. I'm the father of Avery, Grady, and Garrett. Garrett living with ASMD. I am the proud recipient of the Torch Award uh, from last year, 2021. My award uh, was based around the work uh, that I believe the entire Neiman Pitt community and the NNPDF Foundation has done in uh, raising awareness, uh, supporting family services, and promoting research uh, in search of cures for Neiman Picks. Winning the Torch Award was an honor in so many ways. I think for the Neiman Pitt community and the foundation, um, it really shed some light on the great work that the community um, has done over the, the last several years and the strides that we've made uh, toward assisting um, our families and our patients in managing this disease, but also searching for, for treatments and cures. Um, on a personal level, it uh, helped me learn about uh, some of the other great work that's being done in other rare disease spaces and to meet some other 
amazing individuals. The most recent um, would be our work um, with Testing for Tots with uh, Tia and Brian Jones, um, who've uh, been working on newborn screening since uh, receiving their award this last year. The connection started in my kitchen when we were on Zoom, the five of us, and Garrett was next to me. And I met Brian and Tia. We made the connection and then um, they reached back out when they noticed that uh, the newborn screening efforts that they were working on, um, the platform or the testing that was used also included ASMD or Neiman Pick disease. So uh, it really all started on that Zoom where we were celebrating um, the Torch Award. Um, and now we're exchanging emails and hopefully moving things forward with them. Garrett continues to live his best life. School's been great for him. Uh, he loves going every day, uh, continues to love PE, uh, all of his classes. To, to reach the end of elementary school and to be looking at middle school is just an incredible accomplishment for any child, but uh, especially for Garrett and the obstacles that he's faced over the last many years. Everyn and Garrett keep in touch. We all keep in touch with Everin. Um, we've been very fortunate to have Everin in our lives, a former Torch Award recipient. He continues uh, to just thrive uh, at college and in life. We're able to connect with Everin at least a couple times a week. I think the Torch Awards are such a great celebration of success in the rare disease space. It's a tough space where, you know, there are so few treatments that are available and, and so few people to try and move the needle forward. And uh, it's wonderful that they're recognized for their efforts. And I think it gives us all inspiration to continue to do what we do each day in the rare disease community. Great to hear from you, Justin, and thank you Thank you for your ongoing advocacy for the ASMD community. Now my next stop on the Torch Road Trip brought me just outside of Chapel Hill, North Carolina to meet Dr. Kimberly Stevens. Dr. Stevens was chosen to receive a Torch Award for her passionate advocacy for the MPS2 community, as well as her thought leadership on unconscious bias and solutions to address it in order to improve diversity, equity, and inclusion. In 2012, Kim's son Cole was diagnosed with MPS2 at the age of two and a half. Since Cole's diagnosis, Kim has led the way to improve research by publishing the first surrogate clinical outcomes measure for cognitive ability in MPS2. She is currently MPS Executive Director at the University of Chapel Hill's Pediatric Genetics and Metabolism Team, as well as the President of Project Alive, an organization working to find a cure for MPS2. With all this going on, she still found time to visit with me before heading to the beach to celebrate Cole's birthday. Let's head to North Carolina to learn more about Dr. Kim Stevens, our second Torch Award winner of the night. And by the way, stay tuned after the interview to hear from a 2020 Torch Awardee who wants you to know she can still do anything she puts her mind to. Hi Kim, how are you? I'm good. So nice to be here, and thank you for letting us into your house today. Yeah, appreciate it. Glad to have you all here. Maybe we'll we'll, we'll start our discussion and, and tell us a little bit about you and and introduce yourself to to everyone. I'm Kim Stevens, and I am a mom to a boy with Hunter syndrome. I'm also a passionate advocate for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and do unconscious bias training. There's about 500, you know, boys in the U.S. with Hunter syndrome, MPS2. Yeah. So tell us about Cole and, 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 and Cole's journey. One of the things that really drives me as an advocate is my story and how, and sort of the struggle that we went through at the, at the beginning that I never want another family to go through. Cole, he'll be 12, and he got diagnosed when he was two and a half. He's missing an enzyme that takes waste out of his cells. And otherwise, it builds up in the cells and, and causes dysfunction. 
um, failure. He's not all his disease. He's the funniest kid. Uh, he laughs a lot. He likes to play outside. He goes on hikes. So you have made so many contributions to where, you know, to the MPS2 community. You have had the courage, you've had the determination, and clearly you are an unstoppable force. Talk to us about some of those contributions. It's not that you set out and say, I'm going to contribute all this to the world or whatever. It's really just taking on this task. And again, just looking around saying, well, if no, you know, I'm going to do this. I worked with my good friend, um, Melissa Hogan, to create our tooling ability survey. Um, and that came out of the clinical trial and the boys not responding to a regular cognitive evaluation because you, you can't expect a child with Hunter syndrome with maybe an attention span of 10 to 15 minutes to sit for a two hour cognitive evaluation. So the kids would get credit all along the way for each step. If they can pull their pull up up, if they can wash their hands, do they initiate washing their hands? And that's really what the survey is about. We have several companies now using it and verifying, and that's what we want, and now we've, we've got some other diseases picking it up, which is even more amazing. Talk to us about the impact of newborn screening across the U.S. We've always known with this disease that if we can catch the children early enough, then we can slow the progression of the disease, and, and for some we're even seeing we may be able to halt the disease and now we have these newborns and we can say okay let's intervene get them in a clinical trial it'll be wonderful when all the states are on board with that so that's what we're working now um, it's on the federal rust so it's recommended uniform screening panel but it uh, that doesn't mean the states will pick it up right away um, we're going to be running a pilot here in North Carolina and we're hoping to catch quite a few boys. Also, more this idea of being an advocate with the companies that are running clinical trials, saying, hey, have you tried this? And don't just say, huh, let's do it like we've always done it, you know, in which that when the unconscious bias piece comes in, yeah. right? Because that's one of the, the biases. We've always done it like this. You mentioned um, diversity, equity, inclusion, which is such a critical topic in, in today's world. Talk to us a little bit about that connection. I sort of thought of them as two separate worlds for, for a while. You know, this is my rare disease world, and then this was my unconscious bias, diversity, equity, inclusion. And then when you start digging deeper, you start to see all these inconsistencies with patient care and physicians, and, and you start to think how much, how much of that is unconscious bias? How much of that is people just making assumptions about other people? You have to kind of get past that assumption, and I'm always telling um, newly diagnosed, it's like you have to be comfortable with the idea that you're the expert. Project Alive is really our community. We had a campaign early on that was, what does your child want to be when they grow up? Well, our kids just want to be alive. I joined on the board, and then I was elected to president like the same day. I was listening to a board meeting, and they were like, well, where are we going to find someone that has fundraising experience? And where are we going to find someone who's comfortable uh, publicly speaking? Yeah. And every one of those, I was going, oh, that's me. It was almost like they had recorded this, this sort of uh, dialogue to peek me into yeah. taking the, the role. What advice would you have for that generation that's, that's following you? I wouldn't say any of us that are doing advocacy, we're doing it to be a hero. It's just something that was sort of thrust upon us. And we said, okay, this is what we're gonna do. And I think that's really how you become an advocate. You don't have to you know, actually cure the disease, but you've gotta give people reason to want to work towards a cure. Is there anything that you can't do? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think there's some plumbing issues right, in my new house that I haven't really dug into, but I, I'll, I think I'll learn. When you were told that you were a Torch Award winner, what did that mean <laughs> to you? Um, it really meant that I have a great community around me. We've worked so hard to get that awareness up um, that's what it means. It means um, that it's working. I think there's very few people in this world that have your determination and your courage and your generosity to help people as much as you do. So thank you so much 
It has been a pleasure and uh, I'm absolutely humbled uh, to know you. Thank you. I am Riley Noble and I am the 2020 Torch Award recipient. I was super excited to receive the 2020 Tor Torch Award and it felt crazy like that many people, like people know about me. So me and my family made a website called MPS Needs a Cure. It is a website to educate people and to change the world in the long run. So this is my mom, Jamie, and we are working on the nonprofit. Yes, we're working on a nonprofit. It's called A Noble Journey. Our website's called mpsmeetsacure.com. We're really going to push the legislation and education of MPS. So we hope with this website that we could maybe someday get enough money to find more research for the other MPSs that don't have any treatments to maybe find a cure for MPS maybe one day. I'm looking forward to starting the nonprofit organization because there's not a lot of us in our community. So I would like to share it with everybody because we have a really cool community. So in August, we are doing another shoot, which we are super excited for. Crushing Clays for Riley is a skeet shoot and it is for raising awareness and money for MPS. We also do raffles and we do live auctions. Unfortunately, due to COVID in 2020, we did not get to do a shoot, but in 2021, we did get to do a shoot. I'm excited to be going on to the next grade and to be in school because I wasn't in school for a while. I am dancing. The owner of the dance company, Drew Phillips, he made a category for kids with different skill levels, like myself, that can compete with each other. And I thought that was really cool. It made me feel really happy. It meant the world to me to know that I am spreading so much awareness to so many people about MPS. Now that's a pair of powerhouse advocates. Congratulations, Kim, on receiving a 2022 Torch Award. And thank you, Riley, once again, for giving me so much energy and inspiration. Our next honoree reminded me how quickly life can change when I met him at his home near Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. In 2010, at the age of 22, Rob Long was graduating Syracuse University as one of the best, if not the best punters in the world. Everything he had planned for his life was moving ahead. And then he was diagnosed with a rare form of brain cancer for which there is no cure. In 2016, he found his way to uplifting athletes an organization focused on using the power of sports to raise awareness and move forward research in rare diseases. He became their executive director in 2018 and since then has grown the organization to one which raises over $2 million a year. Last year, uplifting athletes reached over 240 million people worldwide with messages of rare disease awareness, inspiration, and hope. Come with me as we head down to Philadelphia to meet tonight's third Torch Award honoree, Rob Long. Rob. Thank you so much for letting us into your home on, on what's going to be a beautiful day yep. in, in Philadelphia. For everybody watching the Torch Awards, just tell us a little about Rob. I grew up in this area from Southeastern Pennsylvania. I had a, a, a tremendous opportunity to play football at Syracuse University. 
I was fortunate enough to, to start there as a, a freshman and earned uh, I think freshman All-American honors and had a, a great career there. Heading into my senior year was an opportunity for me to continue to play professionally and went into that uh, year excited and invigorated. But five days after my last regular season game, I was diagnosed with a, a rare and aggressive form of brain cancer. I don't want to be defined as Rob, who works at Uplifting Athletes and who had brain cancer. I think there's more to all of us as, as people than you know what we do um, between nine to five. We all have a path. And I think your path has taken you from football to, you know, having di been diagnosed with a with a rare brain cancer, yeah. and then you end up in uplifting athletes. Tell us a little bit about uplifting athletes and the work that you do to really raise awareness and to advance the science in rare disease. Sure. So our mission at Uplifting Athletes is to utilize the power of sport to build a community that invests in the lives of people impacted by rare diseases and uh, take the resources that the athletic community has in abundance of, of money and attention and, and kind of drive those towards the rare disease community. And vice versa, we're able to take the, the passion and the stories that are so powerful in the rare disease community and share those with the broader athletic community. You know, you were telling me stories earlier about the bowling event mm -hmm. in, in Indiana. This is a program that I've been a part of for, I mean, literally since my first year at Uplifting Athletes. It's an event where folks in the South Bend community that are impacted by rare disease come to uh, bowl with the Notre Dame football team. You know, the first year we had maybe a, a half dozen people show up and second year we have, you know, a dozen people show up. And then by year six, we have 120 people show up to the event. There's people there that have, you know, cystic fibrosis that have a rare cancer that you are in a chair or on a ventilator. And so you see all this stuff and you see the community together and you see the, the athletes being a part of this and, you know, really being able to engage with them and, and bring, you know, just pure joy to their faces. For us, that's, that's what it's all about. And it's that thing that's hard to quantify, but you know it makes a difference. It, it removes you from that everyday worry of what's next for me and, and you know, what's my next doctor's appointment, what's my next um, treatment. Can you sort of give the audience a little bit about what this Young Investigators draft? Sure. It's an event that's modeled after the NFL draft, but instead of drafting the top athletic talent in the world, we're drafting the top researchers. And so we're in an NFL stadium, we're in this unique environment and we set it up like the NFL draft. There's videos and billboards and the excitement and the music and the energy of the draft. We have NFL athletes and major league baseball athletes and college student athletes all there, a part of it. But we're there to celebrate and recognize the work that these researchers are doing. And that is ultimately what is so important. It's making sure that they know the work that they're doing isn't just in a lab behind a bench without you know, patient involvement. And for me to sit there and say, hey, I'm, I'm here today because of people like you. I've had more time with my family. I've been able to get married. I've been able to get a house and a dog who won't shut up. <laughs> um, and I, like, I, have, I have that because of people like yourselves. I know you're passionate about social justice. What are you doing and uplifting athletes doing to really raise awareness? The issues that we face in, in medicine, uh, the inequities that we face in medicine um, are more than you know, uplifting athletes or, or any one company or several companies can probably fix or, or begin to address. But we wanted to, to try, we wanted to start and so uh, in the fall of 2020, we launched the Underrepresented Researchers in Medicine Initiative. Really, there's two pieces to this. The first is that we need to put the effort forth to engage and to reach out to researchers from underrepresented backgrounds and provide them the opportunity to be recognized at the Young Investigator Draft amongst their peers. And how we need to do that is by making that concerted effort to connect with HBCUs that are doing research to connect with Hispanic institutions that are doing research, connecting with research institutions that serve indigenous populations. These are the things that we need to do and we need to make the effort. We need to be better. What, what were the few key learnings during your journey that you'd wanna share and, and you think really stand out? It's that dedication and, and the consistency and the drive to, to wanna make a difference. And 
it's it's that commitment to delayed gratification and understanding that the researchers that we're supporting over the last five years, it's gonna take them another five, 10, 15 years to get where they're going. And something that I had to learn along the way is that learning to take care of myself was one of the biggest things that enabled my growth. And it was that time that I spent really figuring out how to, to move forward with a psychologist and it, it's enabled me to find real joy and happiness in the work that we do. For me, the, the mental health aspect of this is not often discussed enough. It's certainly better now than it was, but still something that we need to encourage people to, to make sure you're taking care of yourself in that aspect. You know, there's times I, I talk about my story. I have people who constantly are, are reaching out to me and say, hey, I, I just was diagnosed with this, you know, cancer. And then, you know, I stay in touch and they, they pass away. And those, those days are brutally tough. But it's those dark days that make the bright days that much better, right? And it's finding that 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 peace, you know, that no matter which day is coming, you, you have that inner belief and stillness in yourself saying, sun's coming up tomorrow and we'll attack that day. So Rob, we're at the 2022 Torch Awards. What does it mean to you to win Torch Award this year? Uh, it's. It's awesome. It's incredibly humbling. And I know I'm here today because of the people that I work with at Uplifting Athletes and my colleagues and the people that have supported this organization because this organization is nothing without all of them. Uh, thank you for what you do. Thank you for how you do it. And uh, I'm honored to have the opportunity to sit here in your beautiful home and uh, and have this conversation. Uh, thanks so much. Those are uh, incredibly kind words. And I very thankful for, for the opportunity and um, very appreciative to be a, a 2022 Torch Award winner. Thanks, Rob, for spending time with me. I love meeting you and I really loved hanging out with Winston. In 2019, Sanofi recognized another advocate who knows a thing or two about sports. Scott Luia, a wrestling coach from Maine had found that a former wrestler's son, Spencer, had been diagnosed with San Filippo syndrome. His idea to raise money to help the cause turned into a larger movement that inspired his community and beyond. Let's hear from Scott now about how COVID impacted his advocacy and what he's doing to continue raising money and awareness for rare diseases. My name is Scott Luier. I'm a high school wrestling coach in Wells, Maine, and I won the Torch Award in 2019 for money that we raised for the Cure of San Filippo Foundation for Spencer Smith. Back in 2017, um, I was reading a local newspaper and there was an article about uh, Spencer and his dad and his mom, um, how he, you know, his dad grew up in Wells um, and this was the first I heard of it, that he had a uh, terminal illness uh, called San Filippo, sometimes called children's Alzheimer's. And I took that article and brought it to my team. And we were just getting ready for the States, you know, and I kind of told my team that <clears throat> this week I should be thinking about wrestling. <clears throat> and I was thinking about this little boy who would never get to do <clears throat> the things that they're doing. We had had a little bit of money that we had raised throughout the season. And I asked them if we could give half of it um, to the, the Spencer Fund and start a Spencer Fund. A lot of the things that have happened have been because of them. You know, they've wanted to step up and do more. Nathan's mother had a dance for to raise money for Spencer. Uh, it happened to be at, at on a night that we had a tournament, um, and the tournament was, I think, in like an hour and a half away. And they wanted to go to the dance after we got back from the tournament. And we showed up there, 20 of us, um, nobody knew we were coming. 
it kind of shocked me at first. Uh, you know, you kind of hear um, stories about kids nowadays, you know, how they're kind of self-centered, but you know, not, not the kids that I have, not the kids that I've seen. They've really stepped up to the plate and uh, done some great things. Next year, um, I'm looking at raising over $35,000. And then every year after that, I want to try and do at least 10% more. I never really set a goal money-wise, um, but we've always surpassed by at least 10% every year that we've done it. I probably don't have more than five more years of coaching. My youngest daughter is due with her first child in June. Um, you know, and, and she's having a boy. <laughs> she thinks it's going to be a wrestler, but I said, you know, we're not going to push him. You know, if he wants to wrestle, he can wrestle. And I think when I'm done coaching, uh, this might be something that I, I will try and keep at Wells. My assistant coach uh, aspires to take over when I leave. All the people that work for us as volunteers are all part of, you know, this whole thing. Um, so kind of, as we say, we keep it in the family and uh, keep it going. So that's our goal. Every little bit counts. You know, if everybody does a little bit together, it's a lot. I would want to be remembered as somebody who cared for all of them. You know, I've always told them that I'll have their back no matter what. Scott, it was great to hear from you, and thanks for spending time with us to share your story once again, and good luck to you and the team next season. I didn't have to go far to visit either of our next two Torch Award winners. Both are leaders of a national organization and educational platform called Courageous Parents Network. My first stop was in Wellesley, Massachusetts, where I spent time with Jennifer and had the privilege to hear about her middle son, Benjamin, diagnosed with San Filippo syndrome at 15 months. Ben was the namesake for a foundation launched on his fifth birthday, Ben's Dream, which had the goal of raising awareness and finding a cure for this fatal genetic disease. The foundation's effort ultimately raised over $16 million, $16 million to support research and drug development, funded a natural history study, and also supported the creation of a global patient registry. Now, after leaving Jennifer's house, I headed down the road to Blythe Lords in nearby Newton, Massachusetts. Blythe welcomed me to her home and shared how nearly impossible circumstances brought rare disease into her life in 1999 with her nephew Hayden, and her daughter, Cameron. Both were diagnosed with infantile Tay-Sachs disease. I was humbled, humbled by Blythe's passion and enthusiasm for rare disease advocacy, which inspired her family to start the Lord Foundation and eventually Courageous Parents Network in 2014. An award-winning television producer, published author, board member, and recipient of the 2021 Presidential Citation for Palliative Care Advocacy, Blythe is a fierce and vocal advocate for palliative care, for choice, for community, and for meeting people where they are. Let's head out now and learn more about these accomplished women. Hi, Jennifer. How are you? I'm good, Dwayne. How are you today? Uh, I'm fantastic. And thank you for inviting us into your home today and uh, to have this conversation about your journey in the rare disease world. Talk to us about how you become part of the rare disease community, you know, and, and what was that journey? Yeah, so I mean, nobody chooses to become part of the rare disease community, right? Ben was diagnosed in 1996. We had that standard experience that unfortunately rare disease families still have today, which is a doctor says to you, there's nothing we can do, go home and love your child. And you say, well, of course I'm gonna love my child. And then you get home and you start thinking to yourself, what more can I do? 
And um, so Stuart and I did a little research. We found a doctor and we decided that that was what we were gonna invest our time and energy into, which was raising money for research. We hosted our first golf tournament and we had this expectation that we would raise $20,000. Like that was our dream to get to $20,000. I think we raised $82,000 that year. And we suddenly realized we have the power to actually change this if we want to and to make a difference. And so we founded Ben's Dream uh, two years after we actually got into the fundraising game. Tell us a little bit about Ben. Uh, you know, right from the get-go, Ben was a much different uh, son than my older son, Noah, who s seems to be very academic. And he was definitely a boy's boy. Like, you know, he immediately wanted to uh, play uh, sports. He wanted to play with farm animals and his John Deere tractors. And he ate with gusto. He would eat his mashed potatoes you know, with his steak dipped into it. And he was just like this very kind of down-to-earth kid. Um, and, and, and maybe we fostered that because we knew he was going to need those strength points f later on. Because even on his last day, he gave me a smile. So what do you do with that? You just stand up and you say to yourself, I am going to be determined. Talk to us a little bit about your, your passion around research and families and making sure that they take that control. Science into San Filippo syndrome was very basic when we started and we were funding very basic research. I'm not sure we really realized it at the time how, how very basic it was and how far the needle needed to go. Um, you know, I joke and say that I'm a long hauler in the rare disease community because I've been in it for so long. I started to have an awareness that I had to be in this for the long game, that I, I needed to start adjusting what I was hoping for. Hard lesson learned, right? There was a moment at which I had to actually say, this isn't gonna help my child, but I'm gonna stay at it. Because I, didn't, I don't want another mother to feel like I feel. Good afternoon, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. It's thank nice you me. for letting us into your home and into your life. And maybe we can start out by, tell us a little bit about yourself and your journey. The first five minutes of when my husband and I got the diagnosis that our daughter Cameron had in fact infantile Tay-Sachs, I thought for sure I would just fall through the bottom of the floor and go to the center of the earth and never come out again. I didn't understand how I would continue breathing. Because my daughter died so early, I was only a rare disease mom for two years. And since then, I've been a rare disease advocate. But because I spend time with parents who are rare disease parents for years and years and decades and decades while their children are living, it, I, I don't feel like I get, to, I'm quite qualified to be in the same camp as them. The seed of my advocacy came a few years after Cameron died. During Cameron's life, we had benefited from pediatric palliative care from her primary care pediatrician who helped us focus on quality of life. But I went to the Tay-Sachs conference and I went to the home care conference. And the presenter, who happened to be a nurse, was had a row of all this equipment that you could get for your child. And she was talking about when you need a feeding tube, and this is what you'll need to do, and this is what you have to do, and this is the equipment you're gonna need to get. And I was sitting there going, if I were a newly diagnosed parent right now, I would be so overwhelmed by all the things I have been told I need to do, and I have not been told that I have options. And it, that was literally the moment that I was like, I'm going to become an advocate for pediatric palliative care. I'm going to become an advocate for choice making, for decision making, that parents have choices, that none of this is what a must, and no one, including clinicians, can tell another family what they need to do. That was when the light went off. For me, the most important thing that Courageous Parents Network can do is equip parents to feel that they can do the most impossible thing that they are being called to do. When you think about Tay-Sachs, what do you think are some of the current, you know, needs of the community? 
Well, the most extraordinary thing that has happened since um, my daughter had Tay-Sachs and today, which is she was diagnosed 23 years ago, mm -hmm. is the arrival of gene therapies. Right. Too many of the clinical trials for gene therapy are on hold right now, and um, it was uh, six weeks ago that we learned that the uh, research that my family was very involved in supporting that trial was shut down. I'm in a bar in Chicago for a conference and I see this text and email come up and I just burst into tears and I, I was so sad for all the families who who were just going to be devastated by the loss of time. I mean, it'll, we'll get it back on track, but families whose children are living with these diseases, they don't have any time. When Jennifer Seidman and I were developing the Understanding Clinical Trial Unit for Courageous Parents Network, one of the things we felt was really, really, really important to impress upon parents was don't get your hopes up. Don't put all your eggs in this basket, which of course is an, an impossible thing to say to a family for whom that is all they have. That having been said, it has been my experience that with the right support, they can pivot and have perspective and that that perspective can be about all the children who will follow and not about their child. How did the two of you meet? So I was in the, it was in the early days of Courageous Parents Network and I did something that I rarely do, which is I would looking at the obituaries of the Boston Globe and I almost never look at the obituaries. And I saw Ben's obituary in the Boston Globe. And then about two days later, I'm on an airplane and I'm sitting next to a young woman who's going to the same place and she asks me what I do and I tell her that I'm starting Courageous Parents Network and what Courageous Parents Network is. And she goes, oh, you really need to meet my neighbors. My neighbors, Jennifer and Stuart Seidman, their son Ben just died. And I said, oh my God, I just read Ben's obituary in the Boston Globe. So this was very weird. And about a year later, a mutual friend knew Jennifer from university and said, you really need to meet um, this amazing other mom, Jennifer Seidman. And I was like, okay, well, there it is. I recognized the name and we went out for lunch and that was, the rest is history. Yeah, we were fast friends right from the moment. And then slowly but surely, I lured Jennifer to come work with me at Courageous Parents Network. And it was a great transition for me. It was just at that critical moment where you're bereaved and you're sort of thinking about, uh, what is my next step and, and where do I want to go from here and how can I keep my relationship with my child and the more I learned the more I was hooked and uh, and there it is. You know what was it like to get it started and what was the mission and how's that mission changed? One of the things that is really valuable to me in growing CPN or has been is just listening and you know my biggest contribution early on at CPN was the idea to create a unit around clinical trial experience and sort of what families um, might in experience as they consider a trial and talking about things like risk aversion and criteria and, and how those can be hopeful and painful at the same time. Um, and that only came from listening to my own disease community. I mean, being bereaved is sometimes a good space to be a good listener. And so I think we bring that strength because yeah. we have the capacity to listen where an actively a parent who's still sort of in the soup and the messy of, of taking care yeah. of their child might not be able to listen as much. If you had to describe why this work is so important for someone from looking from the outside in, how would you describe that? People on the outside, when you say rare and when you think of whether it's cancer or Tay-Sachs or MPS, you, everybody thinks about research. And yes, we need research, of course, because the research today will save the children diagnosed two years from now, three years from now. But it will not help the families who are actively caring for children right now because it just takes too long. So what can we do to help families who are in their here and now? Too often, rare disease families feel like they're over here 
instead of inside of the circle. And we all have so much in common. A parent understands parenting at a core level. We share so many things. And so I think if we can keep the dialogue open and, and make sure that people are aware of it, then we can have a real conversation. That will be a huge win for us. That's sort of a, the broader mission. But my core mission is that the parents in that moment feel equipped and confident to do this impossible thing. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Blythe, for spending the day with me. Now this brings us to our last honoree for the night. I didn't have a chance to meet Nathan Clayman in person, but I am so glad for technology because it gave me the opportunity to talk to this young man from Brooklyn, New York, when we caught up with a few weeks ago about his advocacy story. It was his own experience living with Gaucher's disease that motivated Nathan a proud first-generation Ukrainian-American to pursue the field of medicine and hopefully improve care for people living with rare diseases. It was meeting a new physician and being connected to the National Gaucher's Foundation that helped Nathan realize he could use his voice to be an advocate and to help other young adults like him realize they weren't alone. This kind, compassionate advocate for others, credits his mom for being his foundation and highlighted his belief that it's incredibly important to reach out to others, share your story, and let people know who might be going through a hard time that they're not alone. Nathan, congratulations on receiving a 2022 Torch Award. You continue to inspire me and your courage, and I can't wait to cheer you on when you graduate from medical school. Hey, Nate, how you doing today? Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us uh, about your 2022 Torch Award. So what was it like before you got diagnosed, and, and then what led to your diagnosis? Before being diagnosed with Gaucher's, my parents and I, we were constantly living in a state of suspense. Doctors kept saying, we don't know what's wrong. They, they could never put their finger on it. I, I didn't know that I'd wake up in the morning and, and you know, randomly start having humongous uh, needle-like pains. So my last bone crisis, fingers crossed, was at 14. I woke up at probably like four or five in the morning and I had this kind of dragging, almost nearly sharp pain in my in my shoulder. And then we just went to the hospital. Um, I was operated on later. They took a, a bone biopsy. You know, the stain came back positive for Gaucher's, which it was kind of a double-edged sword. From one standpoint, you're like, oh, fantastic. Now we know what's going on. But from the other hand, there's no cure. There's treatment, but there's no cure. It's basically like if you have a Lego set and you know, you have almost everything, but you're missing like this one critical piece. It's still a good looking Lego set. But every time you look at it, you're going to be thinking, like looking at the core, that little piece that's not there. And you're going to be like, oh my God, I just need one more piece. I, I understand that, you know, Dr. Minstry, who, who is a great friend. Um, so tell me about your relationship and how he helped your journey with Gaucher. So Dr. Minstry, is a one-of-a-kind man. Knowing him on a personal level, he has such a gentle and kind, open soul. I mean, it sounds cliche, but he kind of treats you as if you're his own family. I wouldn't be here if it weren't for him because, you know, he introduced me to patient advocacy. So I was doing research at Dr. in Dr. Mystery's lab. And then he took to my story and said, I really want you to talk about this if you don't mind. So after that first, um, uh, speaking engagement, everything kind of, you know, went in succession. I very often imagine what, you know, how would Dr. Mystery go about this? You know, I, I look it, toward him for character inspiration. You know, there's a lot of lessons that I've learned from him and that I have yet to learn um, from him. So he's a big part of my story. But as of right now, aside from that, I'm a medical student. I just finished my first year and I'm going back to start my second. I live in Brooklyn, New York with my parents and my 
beautiful dog. I, I chose a path for myself to, to go to medical school and to become a doctor because I want to be to patients what my doctors were to me. Why do you think your story resonates so well with the people living with Gaucher disease? I saw what talking to patients um, can do for people. If there was ever a time that I met someone that also had a few surgeries here and there, that had one surgery or that had something that was really, really took a physical toll on their health at some point in their lives. When we talked about it, it always brought us comfort. People, people want to share and they also, they want to hear my story, you know. It's just comforting to have someone that literally understands what it's like to be in your shoes. If you had to give a message to all the physicians around the world about rare diseases, what would that be? What would you tell them, Nate? So two things, don't overlook any possibility, any remote possibility that you think is out there. The best things a doctor can do for their patient is to give their patients the pain that their patients have, to give their patients credence, and to understand that their pain is for real. For the people who want to speak and advocate and have a voice in the community, what advice do you have them to, to have the courage to speak up? Kershaw's isn't an ocean to swim across, it's a puddle to jump over. Uh, and I say that over and over again. It hurts a lot in every way imaginable, but it's not gonna ruin who you wanna be or what you wanna be or who you wanna become. This is something that it's part of me. It's pretty cool, it's in the background, it's beautiful. It adds to my story, it adds to who I am. It provides context to me, to my mentality, to my growth. I'm a first generation uh, American Ukrainian. So my parents were born in, born in Kiev and then they immigrated here. Ukrainian and, and our culture is a big, big part of me and my identity because I identify it with that side of the culture. Nate, a couple words on your hope, your vision for the future. What would you like it to look like in the in the context of rare diseases? The wish for for you know the medical field and and our little community of lysosomal storage disorders is for there to not be any more misdiagnosis for people for doctors not to overlook you. Nate, before we close, what does it mean to you to win a 2022 Torch Award? Receiving the Torch Award and receiving that notification was extremely inspirational and extremely encouraging to continue doing because, you know, if I got this award, then I'm doing something right and then, and then I'm genuinely helping people, which means that I should continue doing what I'm doing, which I plan to do. You know, I mean, your story helps will help so many people. Your approach to life as to rise up and help other people achieve greatness is so important. And so I really thank you for you know, the courageous position you've taken to help other people. So my hat's off to you, Nate. Nothing but respect, my friend. Thank you so much, Dwayne. Congratulations to this year's Torch Award winners. Thank you for sharing your stories with us tonight and for allowing Sanofi to commemorate the tremendously important and meaningful ways that you advocate for the rare disease community. Thank you for all of your advocacy and the work that you do on behalf of the rare disease community. You continue to inspire us all to advocate for families and patients living with rare diseases. In your own unique way, you've shined a light on communities that are sometimes unseen and uplifted and empowered so many people living with a rare disease. Thank you for your dedication to the rare disease community. Nate, Kim, Jennifer, Blythe, Christina, and Rob, congratulations. You were champions for your communities long before Sanofi selected you to receive a Torch Award, and I have no doubt that you will continue to speak up and speak out for people impacted by rare diseases for many years to come. Your passion will continue to light the way and brighten the journey for those to come. We hope you're enjoying this celebration of you tonight, and we hope you know how much we appreciate all that you do for the rare disease community. When you have your next hard day, and I'm sure that there will be many, know that all of us at Sanofi are cheering for you. We see you, we value you, and we are truly grateful to be partners in your efforts. What you do really matters, and I cannot wait to see what you do next. Congratulations again. We're so honored to recognize you for your work. Thank you for everything you do for the rare disease community, and congrats again on your torch award.
Congratulations on a wonderfully deserved honor and welcome to the 2022 class of Torch Award honorees. Now that takes us to the end of tonight's show. Christina, Kim, Rob, Jennifer, Blythe, and Nathan, congratulations on receiving a 2022 Torch Award. From all of us at Sanofi, we are so honored to have had the chance to share your stories and be a part of your journey as advocates. I hope you'll come back next year and tell us what you've been up to. Thank you for the many ways that you reach out, you create hope, and inspire others in the rare disease community. I want to end tonight with a few remarks from my fellow leaders here at Sanofi and some last words from this year's winners. Thank you for being with us tonight and see you all next year. Bye-bye. Congratulations to this year's Torch Award winners, Christina, Blythe, Jennifer, Kim, Nathan, and Rob. It's a privilege to celebrate your accomplishments through this program. I look forward to this event because it is so important to take time to recognize the accomplishment of leaders like you. I am so inspired by your dedication to the rare disease community and have been personally deeply moved by getting to know you. Thank you for allowing us to share your stories and hopefully inspire others through your work. Your stories are examples of how individual can bring light to rare diseases through their passionate advocacy. What you do and how you do it is important and reminds us that the determination of one person truly can change the world. You were selected to receive this award because of your relentless determination and commitment to advocacy. And I have no doubt that you will continue to work with passion and drive to change the future for rare diseases. Advocates like you are critical members of the rare disease family and of the Sanofi community. The way you use your individual voices to advocate for all people impacted by rare diseases is truly inspirational. I'm so grateful to each of you for your efforts to improve the future of those living with rare diseases. I know that years from now, we will all still be hearing about your advocacy and the difference it is making in the lives of others. Congratulations to each of you on this very well-deserved honor, and thank you for following us to recognize you tonight. Thank you. I wouldn't say any of us that are doing advocacy, we're doing it to be a hero. It's just something that was sort of thrust upon us. There's storms and there's hurricanes and droughts, but in the end, eventually, soil recuperates and flowers grow back. And eventually you will get to a goal that you can feel comfortable with. It may not be the one you thought you needed 20 years ago. And there is no size too small for it to matter because what it is, is something that wasn't there before. Even if it's small, like a goal for tomorrow. You don't have to, you know, actually cure the disease, but you've got to give people reason to want to work towards a cure or towards a treatment. There's no one organization that's going to be able to do this alone. Not uplifting athletes, nobody else. This is going to be a, a, t a true team effort. And that's one thing that I encourage everybody uh, everybody that's watching to just be persistent. We really need to talk about it in a, in a way that still welcomes people in to try hard and doesn't feel defeating. We're gonna do as much good as we can today, but we're gonna make sure that we can continue to do that tomorrow and the day after and the day after that. You know, there's a lot of good that you can do and seeing that impact every single time. It's just, it gives you a little more and a little more and a little more inspiration to do it. It's not go big or go home. If you feel called to do something, something is better than nothing, go for it. I think that's what the Torch Award is about, is sort of, you know, it sounds like a cliche, but blazing the path for other people to come with you, um, because that's what's the most important piece. My name's Nate Claitman. I'm Christina Vargas. I'm Blythe Lord. I'm Kim Stevens. I am Jennifer Seidman. I'm Rob Long, and I am proud to be a 2022 Torch Award recipient.
Hi, Kim. On behalf of everyone at the National MPS Society, I want to wish you congratulations on the 2022 Torch Award from Sanofi. I can't think of a better candidate to receive this honor. Your tireless efforts and advocacy, not only to help your son Cole, but to help the MPS community of Hunter patients is really immeasurable. You've helped lead Project Alive to where it is today, and we wish you the very best in your continued efforts. Hello, Christina. It is with such joy and pride that I congratulate you on winning the Torch Award, which is given to individuals who have made meaningful contributions to the lysosomal storage disorder community. Amidst your busy schedule, your family responsibilities, and your professional aspirations, you have organized and striven to advocate for children and families with neuronal ceroid lipofusinosis type 2 to access potentially curative clinical trials. I cannot think of anyone more deserving and know that you will continue to carry the torch forward on behalf of your child and all with CLN2 disease. Again, congratulations. Hey Nate, congratulations on your torch award. I've had the pleasure of knowing you since you were 10 years old and seeing you go through college, uh, Columbia University master's program in human nutrition, and now at medical school on a scholarship. Along the way, you have been a powerful advocate of the uh, Garche community, as well as made important contributions to the literature through peer-reviewed research uh, that has impacted in how we manage Garche disease. I can't think of a better recipient for the Torch Award. Congratulations and wish you continuing success. I'm proud you chose a path that you are consistent and passionate about. I know you will go as far as your wonderfully inquisitive mind will take you. I have so many wishes for you, so many hopes and dreams. Continue to push limits, continue to bring hope to the community you chose or yet to choose to serve. Congratulations. Rob, on behalf of Uplifting Athletes, congratulations on receiving a Torch Award. Since joining Uplifting Athletes, you've done incredible things in developing how we fund rare disease research and build relationships in the rare disease community. I'm honored to work alongside of you and grateful for the friendship we've developed. You've always owned a unique sense of kindness and everything you did, you approached with such sincerity. We're so proud of you. You are a man of character, integrity, generosity. The only thing bigger than that is your heart. So proud to have you as our son and a shout out to that wonderful staff at Uplifting Athletes. Ever since I met you, I knew you had a special quality about you that would lead to great things. I'm continuously in awe of your kindness, skill, and perseverance. You're an amazing leader and your passion and dedication to invest in the lives of people impacted by rare diseases is an inspiration to me and everybody that you meet. You've overcome so many challenges to get to where you are today. You have earned all the awards that have come and will continue to come your way. Earning this Torch Award is an incredible milestone. Congratulations, Robert. I love you and I'm so proud of you. The entire National Tay-Sachs and Allied Diseases Association community joins me in saying congratulations, Blythe, on being named a Torch Award honoree. Thank you for dedicating decades of your time and your prowess by providing much needed support, education, and empowerment to rare disease families. You have touched the lives of hundreds of NTSAD families and hundreds more through your work with CPN. Today, we celebrate you, we salute you, and we thank you for the difference that you have made in the lives of rare disease families. You are one in a million, Blythe. Hi, I'm Glenn. A big congratulations to Jennifer Seidman for being honored this year as a Torch Award recipient. I've known Jennifer for about nine years, first meeting her after my daughter was diagnosed with Sanfilippo syndrome, the same disease her son Ben passed away from. Jennifer has been a mentor, a trailblazer for research, and a trusted friend. Between her work on Sanfilippo and more recently at Courageous Parents Network, she has had a positive impact on so many lives. You have taken what was a horrible situation for a parent 
and turned it into good. In fact, you've turned it into hope, not only for the San Filippo community, but also for the broader rare disease community. Your intelligence, your drive, your caring has really informed and helped uh, literally hundreds of people, myself included.